In the last video, we took a look at some of the time and space considerations of using iteration or recursion to solve a similar problem. We concluded that iteration seems to save both time and space computationally. In this video, we'll take a look at an instance where recursion makes the code simpler and a problem in which it is a good idea to use recursion. Let's just run recursetree.py just so we can see what the output looks like. It looks like we're doing something to a tree as we've seen in past homework and printing it out a certain way. It may not be the best way, but it shows us how recursion can work, especially for a tree data structure. <coughs> okay, there's a little bit going on in this script. We may not look at everything in detail, but we'll try to make clear the details that help us understand. Okay. We have a couple of exceptions at the top, and if you need to review exceptions, go take a look at the video on exceptions, or look them up in the reading. These are a couple of user-defined exceptions. We have a class called Node. And the recursion we're going to be looking at in this video occurs here inside node, specifically in the print children method. A node will be used in a tree, and each node has a value, a level, a list of children, which can, will contain other nodes, and a parent, which is also another node, except in one special case. We have a method called addChild, which takes another node and appends it to the list of children in this node, and then declares this node to be the parent of that child node. We have a method called printChildren, in which we have a base case we print out the value of this child, or we print out the value of this node, and then we recurse down through the children, printing each one of those nodes as we go along. Each call of print children to a child will cause that child to print itself at a certain level. The number of tabs used for printing out the value in this node is determined by the level of the node. We also have a tree, a simple tree, which is initiated with no root, which has a set root method which I think, honestly, I didn't end up using, but that's okay. And then a traverse method, which simply calls print children on that root node. Recall that each child receives a call from, of print children from its parent, right? The parent is calling it on its child. The root of the tree has no parent. And so when we traverse the tree, it is that first call to root that the tree itself does, rather than any parent node per se. We have a method called make like a tree, 
which turns a tree string ob which turns a tree string into a tree object and prints the object. So in other words, it takes a string, like we see down here in my scent, which is a tree string, and we're calling a tree string, a string representing a sentence, the tokens in the sentence, the parts of speech of those tokens, and then other non-terminal nodes, with parentheses defining the structure of those nodes and tokens. So it's in the format of the pen tree bank. And then we're turning that tree string into a tree object with our initial call to tree. So here's our tree. We'll set current node to none. We'll set level to zero for each substring in the tree string. So this will split on white space. If we simply get a start parenthesis, we do nothing. If we simply get an end parenthesis, we decrement the level and we reset the current node to the current node's parent. If we get a string that starts with an opening parenthesis but is not only an opening parenthesis, then we increment the level and we instantiate a new node okay, with the, with the substring except for the parenthesis as its value and then the level. If current node, so the only time that a current node will not be stored is at the beginning when we've set current node to none. So here we're finding the first node, right? And so if we have a current node, we'll simply add the current node as a child or add the new node as a child to the current node. But if we don't have the current node, we know this is the first node and we set the root of the tree as the new node. And then in every case, we will update current node as the new node. If the substring ends with a per end parenthesis, then we have a token. We have a node, to we have a token node. New node is the string minus the parenthesis. And we just temporarily increase the level as we bring it right back. And we add that new node as a child to the current node. And then we decrement the level because we saw an in parenthesis. So this is kind of a special case for uh, a token node. Else, we will raise one of our user-defined exceptions. So all of this code above this line right here, all of this code has been what we've used to create the tree object out of a tree string. And then we traverse that tree. Now, when we traverse a tree, we have a couple of things in mind. Number one, we have some idea about how many times we might need to follow a child from a parent node in the tree. So if we have, say, a typical sentence of English, there's only a certain depth in that tree that we might expect um, the tree to be. And so if we want to do something to the parent nodes and then to each child node in that tree, we might be tempted to use a recursive method and then we think, oh, well, we saw how recursive methods can cause time or space limitations or invoke problems because of time and space limitations. But here we have a known space and we have a known number of times um, or an expected number of times 
that a recursive method might be called. So we have an instance where recursion might make sense because we don't expect it to be called um, a number of times that will cause an error to take place. The other thing we might notice is that here our print children method is very simple. It's just three lines of code to execute every single one of, to print every single one of the children for each node in the tree. So by using recursion here, we may have saved ourselves some headache from having to read or reread uh, an iteratively implemented version of print children. Tree structures lend themselves quite nicely to recursive methods. But really, we could have done this iteratively as well. We could have printed the children iteratively as well. The biggest arguments for recursion turn out to be readability and elegance of code. So on the surface, that may not seem like an important argument, but remember, you can put code away for six months and then come back to it, and if you can't read it, then that's a waste of your time to try to re-implement it or understand what's going on again. So the argument for recursion really is a human one. What makes us better able to maintain our code? What makes us better able to read um, other people's code or even to understand what's going on in certain places in the code? So there's a trade-off, as with many things in programming. For me, if I want to decide whether to implement something recursively or iteratively, I might ask myself, okay, do I have a data structure whose size is known or at least reasonably predictable? And what is the size of the data of self that I'm working with? That is, am I dealing with a possibly infinitely long string of numbers, or am I just dealing with the length of an average sentence? Um, also, I might ask, does the structure make sense for recursive methods? And trees definitely make sense for recursive methods. And the trees that I often see which store sentences are often of a size that makes sense to use something recursive. That is, I'm willing to trade off the time and space considerations um, that make iterative methods better in order to make my code more readable and more intuitively, uh, more intuitively read. That is, can I understand what's going on? If I can't answer those questions about the data and the data structure confidently, then I'm probably more likely to go for an iterative solution that saves time and space computationally. But both iteration and recursion certainly have their uses. One may be from the computational perspective, iteration. One may be from the human perspective, recursion.